And if you can talk intelligently about them, especially using the long words that I will give you, then you can confound the opposition into just doing what you want. And that's really what the goal here is. So uh, ask questions as we go. We, sh we should have time. This one, because this is really conceptual stuff, I, I'm not going to have a lot of demo. Uh, for those of you who don't know, if you go to PowerShellBooks.com, I wrote an ebook called Secrets of PowerShell Remoting. It's free. That has got the screenshot by screenshot, step by step instructions for doing all the things I'm going to talk about. And none of these tasks are complicated. They're just a bazillion steps. So it would be better for you to have that checklist in front of you if you actually want to implement these things. We're going to spend more time talking about the what and the why, and not so much the how. But feel free to ask questions. So starting point, uh, enable PS remoting will pretty much set up remoting in a domain environment to work perfectly. Uh, once you run that, uh, there's a couple of groups built into every computer. There's a, obviously the local administrators group. There's also this new remote management users group. The members of those groups will be able to remote into any machine on which you have run enable PS remoting. How many of you have more than about five computers? Oh, well, that's good for the stock price. So if you've got more than five computers running around and, and manually typing enable PS remoting on all of them, it's going to get a little bit tedious. So there's a couple of ways you can get around that. Way number one, upgrade all your servers to server 2012 because it's on by default. That would be even better for the stock price. Way number two, there's a new technology called intern net. And it's where you go to a college and you get some kids and you don't pay them and you have them run around and type PS, enable PS remoting on everything. <laughs> Way number three is group policy, which is what a lot of you will probably do. If you want to enable this on a bunch of machines and you want to centrally control it, every single thing done by enable PS remoting can be set up through group policy. It is not hard, but it has to be done in like six different places. So again, in the ebook, it outlines every single one of those steps and where you go in group policy to turn them on or off. It's really just a slog of going through and doing it. Um, so any, anything beyond I'm in a pure single domain environment requires more effort. Um, not single domain, that's not true. If you're in a, 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 a trusting domain, if, if you can get trust going, then enable PS remote will get things working for you. Beyond that, things get more complicated. And beyond this is where you really have to understand why the technology wants to do what it does. So my goal here is not just to help you make the error message go away. I'm going to try and help you understand the right way to do things based on a variety of security decisions, because this is all security, right? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is mutual authentication. The whole point of the Kerberos authentication protocol, which is what you're using in a domain environment, is that it does mutual authentication. In remoting, when you are going off to another computer, you are delegating your credential to that computer so that whatever you ask it to do, it is doing using your credential. So anything you're allowed to do, you can do. Anything you can't do, you won't be able to do. That keeps remoting security neutral. It's not adding or removing anything from security. It's just like if you walked over there, whatever you're allowed to do, you can do. How many of you have teenagers, or will have? You know you're going to have to give them the car keys at some point, right? When you delegate your car keys to your teenager, do you want them re-delegating those keys to some other random human being? No, ideally you do not. And so that's where this whole idea of mutual authentication starts. I'll give you a better example. Let's say you're ready to give your cars to your teenager. Are you going to go stand out in the middle of your street with your hands over your eyes and go, here are the keys, and just hope that it's your teenager who grabs them and not someone else? Are you okay with that? No? You want to look at your teenager and see who you're giving them to, right? That's mutual authentication. They know who you are and you know who they are. You are giving them your credentials, your keys, and you want to make sure you're only giving it to the person you intended to give it to. So in a domain environment, you get all of this for free if, if you are connecting to the remote computer by using its canonical Active Directory computer name. Because that way, Active Directory can play that role in mutual authentication. That's why in the default configuration, all things being equal, you can't remote to an IP address or to a DNS C name because that is your teenager putting on a Batman mask. 
I don't know who you are. I can't see your face. So anything beyond strictly going across trusted connections, strictly using canonical names, you have to get involved with providing mutual authentication because Active Directory can't do so anymore. And you've got two options. One is to use SSL. The other is to turn off mutual authentication, become okay with handing your keys to an anonymous person, and that's the trusted host list. And so we'll talk about both of those. First step for SSL is to get a certificate, a web SSL certificate, just like you would get for a web server. What's the point of SSL? The point of SSL is not encryption. It's mutual authentication. Encryption is a pure side effect that we take advantage of. It's not so much that I want to encrypt my credentials that I'm sending off to PayPal. I just want to know it's really PayPal that I'm sending them to. That's why with an extended validation certificate, your browser turns all bright green when you go to a, a website, right? The browser title bar, and you get these visual indicators that mutual authentication has happened. Now, does the need for an SSL certificate mean that you have to go running out and give VeriSign a whole buttload of money? Nope. How many of you have PKI? How many of you don't have an internal PKI? How many of you have Windows Server? And you could have an internal PKI. Windows Server comes with certificate services. You can stand up your own PKI. It does require some planning, but it's not expensive. And if all you're using it for is to manage these SSL certificates, it does not need to be an extensive infrastructure. It might be one or two VMs that you don't even leave running all the time. You might just use them when you need to issue certificates, and you can leave them off the rest of the time, or put the image on a drive and stick it in a fire safe or whatever else. It doesn't need to be a big deal. But if you want to or need to go beyond your trusted domain boundaries, SSL is the best way to do it. So you start by getting a cert. You install that certificate into the computer account on that machine. That means you can't just double click it because that will install it in the user account. You need to put it in the computer's account. There are ways to script that as well. The book outlines some of them. Alexander gave me some code to help do that too. It needs to go in the computer side. Then you set up an HTTPS listener. When you run enable PS remoting, it only sets up an HTTP listener on 5985. No SSL required. So you're going to create the SSL listener. The default port is 5986. You're welcome to change that if you want to. Here's a command for how to do it. And you bind that certificate to that listener. And that's what makes all the magic juice happen. Now, once you've done that, oh, and here's some, if you want to do this with a, a PowerShell command instead of a command line command, you can. Once you've done that, you can start using your normal remoting commands. But you add minus use SSL. And because you are not delegating your credential in quite the same way, you have to explicitly provide a credential that the remote machine will recognize. And that will be done with the minus credential parameter. So SS, use SSL and minus cred are always done together. You would never use just use SSL by itself. If you try, it'll actually get an error. Cool? Any questions you want to talk about with the SSL and certificate stuff? You can use wildcard certs. That does work. You can use any type of legal SSL cert. Here's another trick, though. How many of you have ever set up a, a web server like IIS and put an SSL cert on it? You ever screw up your certificate request and put the wrong name in there? Like the server's name is Joe, but people get to it with www. And then when they get there, it won't work because they're really connecting to Joe, not www. Same thing. You will only be able to connect to this using whatever canonical name is in the certificate. You can use multi, you know, SAN certs that have subject alternative names, so they can have multiple names if you need that. You can use wildcard certs, but whatever the certificate identifies is what people need to be connecting as, or that mutual authentication can't actually happen. The names have to match. Be real careful with that. I've earned up a lot of money with VeriSign learning that. So any SSL side questions? This is the way to do it. If you can't do Kerberos, this is the right way. The next thing we're going to talk about is absolutely the wrong way, but I won't cover it anyway. And that's trusted hosts. Trusted hosts says, for these computers that I trust, 
don't do mutual authentication. And to expand on that, you're telling PowerShell these computers or IP addresses or whatever you put into the trusted host list could never possibly ever be spoofed. Ever. <laughs> so it's okay for me to hand them my keys without knowing who they are because it's impossible for anyone to impersonate them. Now on your internal network, you might think that's not a big deal, but let's remember that most attacks come from inside the firewall, not from outside the firewall. If you're enabling an IP address, it's not terribly hard for you to impersonate that and start picking up credentials. Because when you use this, once you set up trusted hosts, you still have to engage the connection using the minus credential parameter. You still have to provide an explicit credential but you're not getting mutual authentication anymore. So where is this valid? Uh, let's say you're in a configuration center, you're building new machines, all you know about those machines is the MAC address that's printed on the back label, or you're spinning up new VMs and all you know is the MAC address that was assigned by the hypervisor. So you can use that MAC address to resolve, say, in DHCP to get their IP address, and then maybe add that IP address temporarily to your trusted hosts so that you can make a connection to the machine, join it to the domain, do whatever else, and then amend your trusted hosts list to be empty or back to what it was. So temporary use for configuration scenarios, that's a good, a good call. What's a bad call is permanently tweaking this thing. If you really need to shut off mutual authentication permanently, you should be using an SSL certificate. That's why God invented SSL certificates. <laughs> now, you're going to go up on the interwebs and you're going to get into people's blogs and they're going to, and you're going to find this blog because you're going to try this. You're going to get to a machine that's not trusted. You're going to get an error message and you're going to plug that into the Bing and it's going to come back with someone's blog and they're going to say, yeah, just run set item trusted host value star. That'll make the error message go away. <laughs> that is true. It will. Um, you'll go to hell for doing that. Because what you're saying then is, I'm not going to go stand in the middle of my street and hand out my keys. I'm going to go to the shopping mall and do it. You're letting the entire world have your credentials with no mutual authentication at all. You might as well just write your admin username and password on a post-it note and stick it up in the cafeteria next to the mandatory federal notice of sign for a good time log in with. <laughs> so, this is, this is a, a, a dangerous tool because a lot of folks don't take the time to understand exactly what it is they're switching on and off. It's there for a reason, and that reason is often just temporary use because you need to get to a machine that isn't set up and so mutual authentication is impossible, but you are very in control of that situation. And so you do this to solve a specific need for a specific limited time, and then you set it up right. How do you audit it? How do you audit changes to this? Just if somebody's going to drop it in. Uh, on a local basis, I'm not sure this does get audited. Uh, I'm not sure about how to put it. Most of my customers manage this with group policy, because you can, and the group policy stomps the local. Uh, and the group policy is obviously easier to audit at the top level. So you can say it's not allowed to trust the codes? Uh, yeah. Um, if the change is stored in the registry. I know that if changes in the registry, yeah, so I guess it, you would be able to, but nobody really audits. Can you, can you check that registry key? Yeah, I guess you could just turn on auditing on that key. I don't really have a lot of customers who do a lot of, like, auditing of registry keys on admin workstations, but that's what you'd be looking at if you wanted to capture that. Connect WS man. Well, he wants to check the changes, like in the event log. You also remotely run the yeah, item in the same basic configuration you have there and this value you want to card it? You, you, could, you could retrieve this value easily, yes, which isn't quite the same as auditing because if I turned it on and off between your retrievals, you'd miss it. Other questions? You're sure? Gosh, you're doozy. Is it just too late? <laughs> Yeah, this, this is in HKLM, so I mean, this, this isn't something your average user is going to do, but it's your admins you don't trust, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
this is again something one of the steps I cover in the, the ebook is how to configure this for group policy. It's it's very, very straightforward. Uh, and it's not a bad idea. You can really kind of lock down what machines are, are able to do this. You can do partial wildcards too. It doesn't you know, I've got a customer that does this a lot in the config center, and they use a separate IP range in their config center, and so they'll add 10 dot 10 dot star dot star 10 dot 10 dot 10 dot star to their trusted host permanently and leave it there for the machines that are in the config center, and that's a non-routable disconnected network, and so they know no one else is going to be getting in there because it's a locked room. So they've they've constrained the situation in other ways, and that's how they use that is to configure new machines. That's what they how they spin up new VMs. And you can set it to local as well. Yeah, there's there's a number of wild cardish type things you can put in for that. No, it doesn't do regexes now. This is not Unix. You could try that. Bug that as a suggestion. See what happens. <laughs> okay. Um, again, if you're going to use trusted hosts, uh, you must explicitly provide a credential. So you can see here I'm now able to connect to the IP address that I had added to my trusted hosts. And so long as I provide a credential, in this case, that's a cred to that machine's local administrator account. Uh, and then you would be prompted for the password, which is not shown here, and will be in. So this is actually a, a thing I do to configure new server core machines. I have a little script. Since remoting is turned on on server 2012 by default, I just let the thing do its default, which is to pull an IP address out of DHCP. I know its MAC address from the hypervisor. So I go to my DHCP server, find out what IP address has been given to that MAC address, create a reservation for it so it becomes its permanent IP address, munge my trusted host long enough to connect to it, join it to my domain, put my trusted host back, and then Kerberos takes over and Bob Travel. I don't have that. Well, that's because you've never done this. No. If you've done this, Bob would be wrong. Are any British people in the room? Yeah. Thank goodness someone about that. Okay. Um, a couple of tricks. Uh, again, I mentioned with the cert, uh, you do have to connect using the name on the cert. You can't use wildcards. Uh, star, not the right answer for trusted hosts. These facts are some of the things that wig out the IT security people. And I like to tell my, my class students that there's two types of IT security person. There's the type of person who just doesn't understand what this does and needs to understand it and its rules and its parameters so that they feel they can manage it and work with it. And that type of person you can work with because this does have rules and it has deterministic behavior and when configured in a certain way, it will behave in a certain way. And they can understand that, they can understand how it's managed. Then you've got the type of IT security person who just says no, because he can, and it's inevitable. And because it's security, you can't stop it. You can actually work with that type of person too, especially if you live in an area with a lot of cliffs and had a long pole. <laughs> um, and if you are in a political situation where no, the answer is just no, Remind them of a couple of small facts that have just recently come to light. You have to have this protocol to configure Windows Server 2012. This is where all the management is going. So it's fine to turn it off if you're also willing to just unplug Ethernet, which also makes the server very secure. <laughs> um, but this isn't an option. This is what's replacing what we've had before. So it's a better idea to start getting some configuration <laughs> parameters and processes and standards around it and do that with group policy. That's cool. Something else uh, I kind of want to munge in here if you guys are interested. Uh, how many of you have a political need within the organization to maybe do some really severe level auditing of what's going through remoting? A few people? Uh, you guys know who Beyond Trust is, company? They make a product. Here's the cool thing about remoting. What protocol does it use? HTTP. HTTP is like the coolest, most routable, most, most flexible protocol in the universe. Because it has to be to work over the public intertubes. When you're at your corporate 
headquarters, and you're in your office, and you want to go out to the internet, what do you have to go through other than a firewall? A proxy. And the proxy can make decisions about whether or not you can get there. How many of you have had filtering set up on the proxy so that people can't go to the porn sites, right? So here's what Beyond Trust put together. It's a proxy server for PowerShell remoting. You configure from the command line a proxy setting so that all the traffic for 5985 goes to their server first and it proxies you to the server you were supposed to be going to. Their server analyzes your remoting request, logs the commands you were running, and can have per command, per server, per parameter permissions applied. Can Johnny run that command with those parameters against that server? Oh, he can. I'll go ahead and proxy that. Oh, he can't. I'm going to spew an error back to his client. So there are ways to get extremely granular with this, mainly because it's built using such a flexible standard, not some goofy protocol like remote procedure calls. You ever try to get RPCs through a firewall? Like squeezing a baby through cheesecloth. Ugly. No one's happy. What do you sell session um, it's, a, it's not exactly managing the session configuration in two places because your, your client, because the proxying is happening as a proxy, sends the traffic there even though it's destined for somewhere else. Right. Session configuration is how you can put up these clips and put it on these and monitor these and show them. Session configurations are the one way that you can create that kind of custom level, but not to the, the parameter level unless you're building a bunch of proxy servers as well and not in one spot. Right, because you have to configure them out on every single server. Um, with their product, what you do is every single server won't take connections unless it's come through the proxy. So you get one central spot, which auditors really able to find a deal in. Any other questions or comments, or why are you so quiet? Because I'm trying not to heckle you. Heckle. <laughs> yeah, everybody else does. Building a workgroup. Uh, in a work group environment, SSL, if it's going to be long term, trusted hosts, if it's just for right now, then never again. Or perhaps occasionally. You know, particularly in a, in a work group situation where you've got machines on DHCP and their IP addresses might be changing, you can't use the IP address as a trusted host then. I, I wouldn't use a name because all you're going to be doing is whatever DNS thinks it is at the moment. If there's just a lot of places someone could wedge in there and grab your creds, I, I worry about it. I mean, maybe your house where you're just fooling around, but not for real, real. So this other, this other issue you get into with remote configuration is the hop beyond the first. And the default configuration of an Active Directory environment, my client going to a server is the first hop, meaning my credential gets delegated. And in a default environment, you can only delegate your credential once. Right? This is you handing your keys to your teenager and saying, do not give these to anyone else. That's the default configuration in AD. And there's a bazillion perfectly reasonable business environments where you need better than that. I mean, you've really got two approaches. So let's talk about the first one first, because this is the one most folks will run across first. And it's the CRED SSD protocol. This is a protocol that was introduced to DISTA, so it's, it's in all of the, the latest and newest fun bits. Um, Depending on what your configuration is like, you may have to enable this. So if you get into if you get into PowerShell, this can also be done through group policy. But if you look at your WS man drive, uh, in both the client and the service piece, you've got an authentication protocols auth. And that tells you what's turned on. You can see that CRED SSP is turned off. It means my machine is not going to enable outgoing connections using CRED SSP. You can enable that with enable WS man CRED SSP. And on your client, on the machine that is originating the connection, you use minus role client, minus delegate computer, and you provide the computers that are allowed to receive your credential and then re-delegate it. Star is not the right answer. Okay? No, star. Dot star, not the right answer. 
If you are giving your keys to your teenager, are you okay with your teenager giving the keys to your spouse? Probably. That's an authorized delegation. So maybe star.mydomain.local, right? So long as you're giving the keys to someone else in the family, that's okay. But you can't hand it outside the family. So there are some, some constraints. Again, this, this accepts wild cards. Just use them intelligently. Start out, start is not intelligent. It will make the error message go away, but that's not what you're after. On the server, on the machine that is receiving and then redelegating your credentials, you run this with minus role server, and that's it. And that gives it that capability. If you start doing hoppity 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 hop like a bunny, this gets to be a pain in the, you know, because there's you wind up running this on a lot of different machines. Configurable in group policy, which is nice. Again, the book shows you the places in group policy to go set this up so you don't have to do it manually. It also shows you where to set where to enable the protocol, because it's got to be enabled on your clients and on the servers. And then this this works well. Anybody using this? Yeah? Works? Yeah, sure. Yeah? Uh, um, WinRM is the service that implements the WS MAN protocol, and yeah, I think it does run under local service. Whole different approach. Give me a second. Um, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -da. Uh, yeah, so here's even the path to, the, to do this in the GPO, and you can specify your delegates. Uh, when you create your voting session, unless you change the defaults, you have to specify off to create SSP to make it use the protocol. Now, another whole approach to this multi hop business is to remote to a machine where you have set up a custom endpoint that has a run as account. Because now, this first hop technically doesn't matter. This is impersonating an account that you've hard coded into the session configuration, and it gets a first hop for free, essentially. So that's another whole approach that you, you certainly could use and gives you different ways of, of locking things down and starts to bring in the concept of delegated administration. Those can get tricky to manage quickly. So if you start doing that, document what you've done and why and who and everything else. Yes? Audrey heads yes. Okay. Um, alternately, taking Cred SSP off the table, you can, I was going to say, you can simply configure your domain, but this is anything but that. Um, you can configure Kerberos in the domain to allow multiple hop delegation, to allow further delegation. This does not require the Cred SSP protocol, but it does require several more steps that have to be done in the domain. These are, Alexander and I were talking, these are scriptable steps. These aren't impossible to achieve. It's just a lot of things that have to be done correctly in order to get it to work. It's, it's several little buttons you have to press. So this is also an option. Uh, as it turns out in the conversation today, this is the option the Microsoft product team recommends. So they've not written that down anywhere, so no one knows to know. But they secretly recommend this. <laughs> uh, and this does also solve the problem of third hop, fourth hop, so forth. I've been in a couple of environments where this was not allowed for political reasons. Because of the whole concept of I'm handing you my keys, I don't want you just passing it around inside the family, even. I want to put more constraints around where that can be redelegated to. And for them, for those customers, they found that Cred SSP was a better fit for them. Uh, and there's a couple of heads nodding. So you've got options. There's no one true path. It's what fits your business needs the most. OK, ask questions about this stuff. Those are the, the difficult bits of remote configuration and the whys. I was going to make a comment about the Kerberos delegation. If you, um, if you built that set, um, set up correctly up front, if you put the hand inside it from scratch, you can try to set it up as you're sort of debugging which delegation to do the configure. You've got to make sure you refresh the cables to this 
Yeah, and yeah, if yeah, if you if you are um, if you are deciding that the right answer for you is to enable a Kerberos delegation, and you have never set this up before, set it up. You're going to have to blow away all your Kerberos tickets. Make sure that because you know when you log on, you're given a ticket, and that has to be marked for delegation up front, or all the changes in Active Directory in the universe won't make any sense. Think of it as like a group policy. Right? Just because I go change a group policy doesn't immediately mean every computer jumps on and takes that new setting. It takes time to refresh. These tickets have to be discarded. And the trick is because renewing or getting a new certificate puts load on a domain controller, the Windows client pieces have a lot of code in them to keep them from doing that. They would prefer to hang on to a ticket for its lifetime and then renew it as many times as they're allowed to before they actually go get a new ticket. So that's where tools like the curve tray tool, if you've not used that, can be very helpful in seeing exactly what ticket you've got and when you got it and how long it's got to live and all that stuff. So that if you are making configuration changes, you know if you've got a fresh ticket or not. Because otherwise you can make configuration changes. Let's see, still doesn't work. Okay, I'll go make more changes. Still doesn't work. Make more changes. Still doesn't work. Switch back to netware. Still doesn't work. <laughs> Unplug everything and go home. That worked just because you are still using the original ticket you got before you made all those changes. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so I've already got this deck up there. Uh, the ebook the e is up there. It's free if you want to download it. It's on PowerShellBooks.com. Uh, if anybody needs my contact information or anything, just hit me up. I've got business cards scattered all over the place. Uh, you're welcome to try and drop me an email, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, I've got the most aggressive spam filters in the universe. Um, any other remoting questions? I had a question. If you're using group, I've implemented a group policy, and it doesn't seem like 100% of the machines have taken that policy. So, you, so you've Windows. got a GPO, but maybe not every machine has picked it up yet? Correct. I, I, uh, is there a way to audit or determine how that failed, or what do you do with the machines that have failed? It, you have to get into result and set of policy. It, it's often easiest to go <coughs> to the client. First of all, I might run an, an RSOP test in the domain mm -hmm. to see if there was something keeping that policy from hitting that particular machine. I mean, you know how complex GPOs can get, so that's easy to, to screw up. Then go down to the machine and get a dump of the GPO policy, get it to reapply into a dump of the policy, and see if the setting is even coming down. And if the setting's coming down and it's not going into effect, something up. Like, gotcha. something, something up. Uh, maybe reinstall that machine or upgrade to Windows 8 because it's all fixed. Um, I've seen more problems with XP machines, frankly, just because a lot of this stuff, I mean, this all, this all works in version 2 of PowerShell as well, and a lot of this stuff bolted onto XP just gets a little pinky. I have a lot of problems with promoting on XP, and I don't think anyone cares. I mean, you know, it's a little girl with us. Nothing else? Okay. So uh, thanks for being here. Enjoy the rest. This is my last session for the summit, but I'll still be around. So please you know, take a minute and let me know what you're thinking of it. Take a minute let me know what you think about next year. We're still running around trying to you know, look at dates and venues and things like that. Um, believe it or not, one of the most challenging things is making sure we're bringing you down here at a time of year when the hotel rooms are less than $5 million a night. Um, so we're figuring that out too. but. Give me some feedback. Let me know. I mean, we'd love for you all, all things being equal, for you all to be here next year with, with two of your friends apiece. Um, so, you know, help us figure out what we can do that. Well, <laughs> if, if you don't have two friends, we'll get you on match.com and find you one. <laughs> find PowerShell's match for you. What's that? They run SQL Server. Run SQL Server? <laughs> oh, do they? Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I don't love SQL. Well, no, no, that's it. That's exactly right. Okay. Uh, okay, so thanks for being here, and uh, I'll see you around.